Hello class, this week we will be looking at chapter 22.1, The Scientific Revolution. So what ends up happening is during the mid-1500s, this is right around the end of the Renaissance, um, actually in the middle of the Renaissance, sorry, scientists, they end up starting to question beliefs and they start to make new theories based on experiments. Okay, so what you do in science class, you do experiments. This idea starts during the science re scientific revolution. Looking at our objectives this week, we have four objectives. First, list the circumstances that lead to the scientific revolution. Summarize the development of heliocentric theory that is looking at Copernicus. Describe the scientific method and explain Newton's law of gravity. So one is going to be focused on gravity. And last, we're going to look at the importance of new scientific methods. These are for objectives. We are going to be looking more in depth at these objectives in class. If we think of science, science is a new thing. Up until this point, people had a medieval view. What that means is that most people's knowledge in the Middle Ages, it comes from the Bible and it comes from Greek and Roman sources. Now, if you think of the Bible, the Bible is a spiritual book. It is a religious book. It is not a necessarily a scientific book. People just sort of believed that God would help them if they prayed, that they would be cured if they were sick, okay? What starts to emerge is that people are now starting to test things and observe things to try and understand the world around them. So they are no longer only relying on God. They are now testing these theories. One of the first theories that sort of comes out at this time is called the geocentric theory. Now, the geocentric theory is an old theory. It is proven that it is not correct. And what it says is that the, the moon and the sun and all the planets revolve around the earth. So geocentric is basically, think of geography, which is like earth, that everything is surrounding the earth and that the earth is the center. This is what people believed during the medieval times and during the beginning of the Renaissance. Now the Renaissance was a very important time for art. We've sort of already explored this idea. But it was also a very important time for science. So the Renaissance, because it prompts or sort of looks at a new way of thinking about the world with the idea of humanism and observation, this also sparks um, the growth of science. We call this a science revolution. Now, the science revolution, this is sort of a new way to observe and view the natural world. So what is starting to happen is we have a bunch of men, mostly men, some women, mostly men, who start to observe, which means they start to look at what is happening around them, very carefully. Again, this is a, this idea of their experimenting. They are observing things like the stars. They are observing things on how um, things are moving. Okay, um, these are all observations. This leads to new discoveries. The reason is many of these scientists who are observing things are starting to take notice that what they observe does not match what these ancient things are telling them. So they start to sort of challenge what everyone else is thinking. We also have um, overseas exploration happening. This also opens up thinking. So we have um, sort of the, the importance of astronomy and astrology. That is the observation of the stars. This becomes important during overseas exploration. We also have many new developments in um, mathematics. So people are starting to look at numbers in a new way. They're starting to observe how uh, patterns in the natural world 
and putting those patterns into math. This leads us to the discussion of the heliocentric theory. Now remember, before, the geocentric theory believes that everything revolves around the sun. I mean, sorry, in, uh, around the earth. That is, the sun planets are circling around the earth. What Copernicus, Nikolai Copernicus, starts to observe is that actually he thinks that everything revolves around the sun. This is the heliocentric theory. Widely accepted geocentric theory is being challenged as being inaccurate. This is a, a theory, the geocentric theory, though everything revolves around the earth, that people have believed for thousands of years. Copernicus is basically saying that, no, that's not right. Later, scientists can prove that Copernicus is correct. But we should note that Copernicus, during this time, he faces a lot of conflict with the church because of his beliefs. Another important person is Galileo Galilei. Galileo also makes more advancements in astronomy. Astronomy is the study of the stars. He also starts to observe planets and stars using a telescope. Okay? A telescope, this is going to be a very new invention at the time. What he starts to discover is he starts to observe planet surfaces. What he observes supports Copernicus. It supports the heliocentric theory that the sun is the center. He also starts to find out, uh, out about four moons of Jupiter, which means that he is observing pl uh, the planet Jupiter. And he starts to um, look at sunspots. Okay? This does not make the church very happy. The reason why is that the church does not necessarily like change. They believe that sort of God has um, given them the right answers. So for someone to come in and say, actually, what you believe is wrong, is going to make the church upset. So what happens is the church attacks Galileo. They believe that if people start to believe in people like Galileo, it's going to weaken people's faith in God. So science is going to challenge people's faith. What ends up happening is that the Pope forces Galileo to say that what he said about um, heliocentric theory and about planets is wrong. So he's asking him to deny what he believes. This leads us to a new method of how to deal with scientific facts. This is based on Bacon and Descartes' observations of the world. Now, Descartes is also known as a philosopher. He, he is known to observe the world. They come up with what they call the logical approach. During this revolution, they end up um, creating a scientific method that allows for a certain series of steps in order to form a theory. So instead of just forming a theory by observation, you have to observe first, then experiment, and do not jump to conclusions. So Bacon and Descartes, they're the ones who um, sort of key, are the key people who term this scientific method. <clears throat> Bacon, Specifically, he is a, a trying to urge scientists not to start with their conclusion, but to simply experiment. Descartes, his idea is to use logic. Now, logic is basically to use your brain and to use math to make sure to think through your decisions, to not act um, rashly or quickly. And that is how you will find out basic truths. This is important. This scientific method is what we still use today. Experiments in a laboratory, they are using the scientific method. You, in science class, use this. This comes to another new theory. 
Another new theory is the law of gravity. This is by Isaac Newton in the U.S. Now, Newton, he was an English scientist, and he develops a theory of motion. So what it's stating is that um, everything is in motion. Matter and space, the earth is in motion, and this is sort of the foundation of the laws of gravity. Okay, So if you're unsure what gravity is, that's more of a scientific method. I'm not going to focus on what gravity is, but just know that this theory is very new at the time. If we didn't have gravity, we'd all be floating around in space. How Newton explains it is that motion in space and Earth is linked to the universal gravitation. This is the idea of a magnetic force on the Earth. So holds that every object in the universe is attracted to every other object. So um, our bodies, we are held down because we are attracted to the Earth. We have a magnetic attraction. Newton also views um, the universe as a mechanical clock. Okay, So these are sort of some of Newton's theories when he's talking about the law of gravity. So just to note, Copernicus, he is one of the forefront Copernicus and Galileo are the forefront of um, the scientific revolution. And it continues on through many different um, centuries. Okay, What ends up happening is the scientific revolution spreads. So we have the decline of religion and the decline of religious belief. We have the rise of observing things through science. Now some of the things that improve are the, the instruments we use to observe. One example would be the microscope or the barometer and the thermometer. These are all instruments that are developed during the scientific revolution to observe the world around them. Other, the more new instruments that develop, the better the observations that happen and the more new discoveries we have. An example would be with the microscope. They start to realize what are things actually made of. Atoms, okay? This, they're able to observe these things by looking very, very closely at very small things that you would not be able to see. This is also when you start to get the, um, the understanding of germs. What makes people sick, okay? All of this sort of leads to more and more technology being developed. I would say that today the scientific revolution continues because we still have more things being developed, new technology, and we're observing more about science every day. So as you can see, we have developments in medicine and the human body. We have um, Vesalius. He is observing how the body works. That's anatomy. We also have people like um, Edward Jenner. He's starting to produce medicine that helps people um, stop from getting sick for smallpox. We also have um, discoveries in chemistry. We have Robert Boyle. He's arguing um, that matter is made of different particles. That's the idea of atoms. We have the idea of um, the interaction of volume. This is the idea of temperature and gas pressure. If water changing different forms. These are all sorts of um, important things that start to develop during the scientific revolution. Your question for the video this week. Out of all the theories and all the men we've discussed in this chapter, I want you to choose what do you think is the most important theory or person in the scientific revolution.